All right, I think we could, oh, a little early. There we go. All right, I think we can get started. Thank you all for joining today. Uh, today's lunchtime art talk, which as many of you know, is a weekly series led by Hammer curators on works from our collection. Um, this series will focus on artists featured in Made in LA Aversion. Uh, following LA's, LA County's recent updated guidelines for museums, we're preparing to reopen the museum and welcome visitors to the exhibition mid-April. We really look forward to having you back and really look forward to having you be able to see the works in person that you've been, um, hopefully, if you've been listening to these or tuning in, um, have been engaging with. Uh, my name is Nicholas Barlow. I'm a curatorial assistant at The Hammer, and I'll be facilitating this afternoon's talk on Patrick Jackson. Uh, after the presentation, I'll be able to answer all of your questions or any questions you might have about the work. Um, a few Zoom notes before we begin. When the presentation starts, please select speaker view in the top right corner of your screen. And the middle, uh, in the top middle of your screen, please click on view options to ensure side-by-side -side view and fit to window. Uh, make sure all of those are checked. Uh, please note that today's program is being recorded. Uh, you have an option to toggle your camera on and off using the camera icon at the bottom of the left corner, uh, whatever you are most comfortable with. Uh, you will remain on mute until the end of the presentation, at which point I will unmute those who have questions. During the presentation, if you have any questions or technical issues, uh, you can ask those in the chat as well, um, and uh, one of my team members will be able to help you with that. All right, let's start the presentation. Please go to the first slide. Patrick Jackson is a Los Angeles-based sculptor who works with and produces discrete objects and immersive installations. His practice often involves invent in, in, uh, interventions in the architecture and gallery of the gallery space to evoke a psychologically charged alternative environment. These in installations often possess a cinematic backlot quality and offer an uncanny rendering of reality. His gestures, the placement of the work, the materials he uses subtly contain charged and layered meanings. To this point, literature and theory are a central part of Jackson's practice, as his projects are invested in unpacking a complex network of cultural references, as well as engaging a vast array of cultural detritus. Today, I will be talking about Jackson's head hands and feet from 2011, two sculptures which are included in Made in LA 2020, a version, and installed in the galleries of the Huntington Library, Art, uh, Art Museum, and Botanical Gardens. I will also be discussing some of the artist's earlier works and previous installation to give context and background to his practice. Next slide. Patrick Jackson was born in 1978 in Los Angeles. He earned his BFA at the San Francisco Art Institute and MFA at the University of Southern California. Jackson works primarily as a sculptor, creating pieces and installations that consider the material nature of objects and architecture, and investigate relationships between physical objects in space and how viewers engage with and navigate an exhibition. Next slide. His mixed media environments often possess a cinematic quality akin to a stilled narrative. His objects can feel like props pulled from a movie whose subject is elusive to us. Scattered throughout a gallery space, these objects and forms feel surreal and mysterious, perhaps evoking a crime scene, a film set, or a dream. Jackson borrows from the cottage industry of Hollywood film production, employing prop makers and special effects artists to help produce his works. In another borrowing from the film and television industry, the artist outlines each of his exhibitions like a TV showrunner, pinning index cards to his studio wall, featuring language that informs his practice and piecing together texts and excerpts as source material and context. 
However, this context often remains a mystery to the viewer engaging Jack and Jackson's work, or at least upon initial kind of in, uh, 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 approach. Uh, they remain in the background. This information remains in the background, but they can be felt and create an illicit mood, a feeling, and a sensation of psychological unease. Next slide. There's an investment in the questioning of hierarchies of objects and images in Jackson's practice. Why does one object hold more value culturally, financially, intellectually than another? And what happens when you confuse and subvert these hierarchies? In his 2010 tchotchke stacks, the artist created a series of precariously constructed totems of found objects sandwiched between panes of glass. A tchotchke is a name given to a cheaply and mass-produced sculptural object, porcelain clowns and cherubs and cute renderings of dogs and cats and so on, that hold little value as art objects, but can contain personal importance to those who acquire and collect them. Objects can be charged and imbued with memories. This transformation, this psychological charging, is of interest to Jackson. When placed in a gallery, and on a pedestal and arranged in groups, these cheap goods shift their meaning. They become activated. Next slide. For his 2017 exhibition, Know Your City at the Wattis Institute in San Francisco, Jackson partitioned the gallery space by stitching together theater backdrops depicting New York City. Along the walls were segments cut from used billboard vinyl, stretched like canvas, featuring faces, some, identi some identifiable, some not, some almost familiar. I would ask, is this Pierce Brosnan on the left, or is this John claude Van Damme, or is this neither? Both of these visual visuals address cityscapes, but not directly. The backdrops dress gesture to an imagined New York to be rendered in photographs. The billboard cuts gesture and uh, gesture to an actual visual landscape of Los Angeles, but forefront images that are meant to meant in some ways to be peripheral and not examined closely. To Jackson, this confusing sensation of near familiarity and uncanny recognition is a primary subject matter that he's invested and investigated throughout his work. Next slide. Head, Hands, and Feet was first presented in Jackson's 2011 exhibition, House of Double, installed in a vacant two-bedroom apartment adjacent to the artist's own residence. For his installation, the artist placed curious objects and subtle sculptural invest, uh, in, uh, interventions throughout the, the empty apartment. As visitors roamed from room to room, they were left with their own imagined to piece together the connections between the disparate objects and sculptures. The domestic space and its blood red carpet heightened this experience, adding a patina of menace to the environment. Next slide. Head, hands, and feet was placed in two adjacent rooms so that the piece could not be examined together at once, but had to be taken in one by one. Viewers had to compare the two sculptures in memory, enacting a sort of deja vu of moving between the spaces. Next slide. In an adjoining room uh, was a group of vintage found coffee tables which the artist culled from Craigslist, with piles of mud, dirt-like forms placed on top. Another doubling takes place here. Though these forms look like mud, earth, organic material, they are actually epoxy molds. The artist dug up dirt from the side of the freeway, from a freeway overpass, mixed it with water, and sculpted a pile. He then covered the mounds with epoxy and hollowed them out once they were hardened. So in ways, this is, these are not piles, these are prop piles, these are fake piles. Next slide. In the kitchen, Jackson staged groupings of domestic objects, a cane, a wrench, a sponge, a plate. And he arranged them, one pile, one kind of arranged in a pile, kind of disorganized, and one neatly structured. 
In relationship to the bodies in the other room, this dom these domestic objects take on a menacing air of evidence. Even the name House of Double, the name of the exhibition from 2011, recalls a film noir title. It's inviting a sort of mystery that that would take place, but it's giving you no real context or information about that. Next slide. This is the work at the Huntington in the galleries. This bearded figure moved from the apartment near his apartment, uh, the apartment near his home uh, in 2011 to the Huntington in 2020. This bearded figure is a rendering of the artist, a full body cast of Jackson dressed in pristine denim and donning an obviously fake beard and wig. Jackson does not have a long beard and jet black hair. This is a disguise of sorts. Next slide. To Jackson, the transformation from self to object was an igniting impulse behind the work's creation. It is both Jackson and it is also both not Jackson. It is Jackson, but it is a Jackson that is in disguise. When you take a body cast, when you have a body cast created, especially of the face, your face is covered with a mold. And in that moment, you can't sense anything. You can't smell really, except the kind of mold that is being taken, the kind of uh, the, the material. Um, you cannot uh, see, you cannot really hear. In many ways, all of your senses are removed. And so Jackson in kind of creating this mold decided to leave some of the details, um, I guess not add some of the details that you would normally add to a body mold of the sort. He left the eyelids to almost be kind of closed where you can see the seams. Um, let's go to the next slide. Next slide. Here you can see him. Oh, back one slide. There you go. Um, you can see there's a tremendous amount of detail to the nostrils. There's a tremendous amount of detail to his kind of eyebrows, but the eyes actually have this kind of closed thing. Not only are they closed, but they would never open. There is also an uncanny doubling happening in the gallery of the Huntington, much like at the residence in which they are originally shown. You cannot see both pieces simultaneously. You have to walk and see one and then move over to the other. But also there's a, a doubling in this idea of, I guess, fakeness. We know this is fake. We know upon examining the body from these obvious details, including the kind of uh, uh, absolute closure of the eyes, but also the kind of uh, faux beard and hair, that this is not a real person. Uh, that this is a rendering of a person. But there's that pause, there's that break. You start to kind of split between this idea because it is an uncanny but also unsettling sight to see in the gallery. There's also another kind of doubling happening, which is very interesting. Go to the next slide. Here's the work in 2011 when it was shown at the apartment. Go to the next slide. Here's the work at the Huntington. Somewhere in between the, that show and this show, the face has become dirtied. In some ways, it has taken on a little bit more life with time for some reason. There's a discoloration which kind of moves away from the kind of uncanny mannequin-like mold of the first when it was originally show and more into the kind of decaying cadaver, which is quite unsettling. Next slide. Oh, actually, go back a slide. Uh, to create this mold, uh, Jackson relied on a kind of Frankenstein uh, uh, construction of different types of body casting and molding. The head was produced uh, in collaboration with a special effects team and a special effects house who often make kind of dummies and uh, 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 kind of uh, special effects for movies. Um, it is a prop head. Uh, it's uncanny to see a kind of prop of this sort up close. It's uncanny to see something which is actually kind of meant to be seen in a movie in that way, a kind of ephemeral sight to be actually able to examine is a strange sensation. Next slide. For the hands, 
Jackson cast them in silicone, worked with someone to cast them in silicone, and then began to sand them down to remove any details of his actual hands so that this kind of smooth polish finish fetish kind of form was emerged. Um, he then applied paint and paint and then sanded and then paint to create this ridiculously smooth object. Now also to know that it's silicone, know that it actually has some kind of give to it, that they would be rubbery and bounce. And it's to this fact that actually uh, uh, Jackson was interested in referencing a kind of a sex toy. So it's to produce a kind of his hands in the mold or in the style of, I guess, a sex toy. Next slide. The feet are done in a style of a mannequin. They're produced with a mannequin manufacturing company. And they're using a color, which is a Caucasian mannequin paint to cover it, in which the artist took molds of his feet and then worked with a mannequin company to produce these kind of mannequin feet. So once again, we have these three different types of molding happening, these three different types of casting happening. And it's this, once again, it's all of these forms, the kind of dummy of the head, the kind of sex toy late uh, silicone of the hands and the kind of mannequin feet, all kind of gesture towards humans. They're stand-ins for humans. And there's something in actually in, in the world, we accept them as kind of a reference to the body, but not fully a reference to the body. And Jackson was really interested in this unfamiliarity and this play between this familiarity of a kind of it being reference to a body, but also not a body, but also in that relationship, a kind of reference to sculpture. All of these in many ways are kind of low grade or kind of lower grade, you know, you wouldn't deem them to be artistic sculpting practices. And so by placing them into the gallery, there's once again, this questioning of the hierarchy of objects. Next slide. Installed at the Huntington Jackson's work contrasts with the sculpture at flanks. Zenobia in Chains from 1859, a towering white marble sculpture by Harriet Goodhue Hosmer, a key work in the Huntington's collection. Hosmer, who led a team of 20 workmen in her sculpture studio in Rome, often depicted strong female figures. For Jackson, these starkly different works highlight an important aspect of figurative sculpture. The vertical is image, and the horizontal as material. For Jack, uh, yes. And in some ways also this kind of idea of the horizontal as body, which is quite interesting. And I will kind of next slide. Also, I wanna kind of point out this idea of the denim he is wearing and the kind of old prospector like beard that he is kind of, bit, uh, uh, is, is kind of donning. Um, there is this kind of engagement also with this very American figure and this American form. And that Americanness kind of also underlies and kind of speaks towards, I think this uh, a kind of a further unsettledness of the structure of the figures because it speaks towards a kind of violence, an inherent violence within the kind of placement of a body in a space, and this complicating history of, of museums installing figures and forms and also bodies. So next slide. I want to end the talk with a few questions to you all, which is I want to ask the question, what does it mean to put a body into the museum space or a death mask? Or what about human remains? I also want to ask this question, can an embalmed body on display be considered sculpture? And what does it mean to enter death into the space of the museum in a manner in which Jackson is kind of gesturing to? How does this affect the works around it? So you can ask your questions or you can submit your uh, replies through the Zoom chat feature located at the bottom of your screen. And you can also ask questions verbally, and uh, I, I would invite you to talk and, and kind of give a comment. Uh, you can do so by raising your hand physically like this, uh, or if you go to the participants module at the bottom of the screen, there's a little digital hand thing we'll be able to get you. Um, terrific. Great. So I'm going to see if there's any questions. Yeah, thank you guys. 
Uh, I wanted to kind of, you know, bring up these questions again, you know, I, in researching this and thinking about um, Jackson's work and especially these pieces, I started to think a lot about it kind of embalmed bodies, especially the kind of embalmed bodies of, of dictators and former leaders uh, that are often on display. Uh, Vladimir Lenin's um, body has been on display for over 90 years in Red Square. Uh, 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 there are this kind of there's this cultural kind of idea of preserving a body and showing it. And I started to think about this idea that that, you know, is also kind of uncanny in the sense of uh, like seeing a, a dummy from a, an action movie in the real world, um, which is strange because it's, it's not something that's meant to be closely examined. Seeing an embalmed body such as a kind of political leader is also a, an uncanny situation. Um, So yeah, does anyone have any questions? Were we good to wrap it up? Terrific. Well, thank you all for joining. And we're really excited to see you all in the museum and we're really all excited to see you. Um, we hope everyone's okay. Bye all.